purpose of this presentation is to provide training on basic ergonomic concepts and practices to raise awareness of the risks and how to reduce them to prevent soft tissue injuries. Why are you thinking of working in construction? There are many reasons, such as the ones on this slide. It's a good career for individuals who enjoy working with their hands. You get to see what you help to build. You can solve problems. There is strong camaraderie with coworkers and the potential to make good money. But there are also risks associated with this work that can cause injuries. So it's important to learn how to protect yourself from these risks. Today, we're not going to be talking about traumatic and fatal injuries. Instead, we're going to talk about the injuries that result from the physical work done every day. Without safe work practices, this work can break down a worker's body over time, result in a disability, and force a worker to leave the industry or retire early. You may not think this will happen to you, but talk to anyone who's been in the industry for many years, particularly middle-aged or older construction workers. They will tell you these injuries are common in construction. The good news is that they can be prevented. Today's goal is to provide training to identify the causes of sprains, strains, and soft tissue injuries, understand the risks, and know the steps to take to prevent them. By the end of today's training, you should be able to identify the ergonomic hazards, review the basic ergonomic controls for hazards to prevent injuries, describe the proper body mechanics for lifting tasks to prevent injuries, identify the benefits of doing stretching exercises, describe at least one safe lifting practice, and describe the risks of using prescription opioids and self-treatment for pain management. Let's start with why it's critical to reduce sprains, strains, and other soft tissue injuries. First, they are very common, causing more than one-fourth of non-fatal injuries suffered by construction workers every year. About 21% of construction workers experience these injuries based on what's reported but we know that many more will suffer from chronic or persistent pain. One type of sprain or strain is caused by overexertion of the body from handling building materials and equipment, particularly heavy or awkward materials or equipment. This often results in low back injuries. Since you only get one body in your lifetime, it's important that you learn how to properly handle materials as early as possible in your career and use safe lifting practices every day to protect your body from damage. To understand how to prevent an injury, it's important to understand what's happening to your body. The tissues of your body respond to stress similar to other materials, such as metal, concrete, and wood. As materials are exposed to physical stress like weight and environmental exposures, weather, heat, cold, and rain, they break down. This slide shows examples of this happening. Back in 1951, the Duplessis Bridge collapsed into the St. Maurice River in Alberta, Canada. Even though the bridge was only three years old, it could not stand up against the extreme cold and heavy loads that traveled over it every day. Just like that bridge, the tissues of your body respond to stress and heavy loads, causing them to gradually break down. The bottom right photo of the foot shows an Achilles tendon tear from overexertion. In the medical world, Sprains, strains, and other soft tissue injuries are called muscular skeletal disorders, or MSDs. They include damage to the different soft tissues of your body, your muscles, nerves, bones, and connecting tissues, like tendons and ligaments. The damage is cumulative. It develops over time, not usually from a sudden accident, and may become chronic or persistent. In other words, the damage and pain could last for a long time, possibly the rest of your life. The photo at the bottom on the left show the structure of your low back, the most common body part injured. The soft disc is a cushion between each bo uh, bone, but the center jelly in green may push on the spinal nerves, the orange tubes, when the body bends forward. One way to think of it is like a jelly donut being compressed. The back is complex. Once the tissues wear and tear, it's very hard to get them to heal. The bottom right photo shows a worker with knee bursitis caused by kneeling on a hard floor often without the benefit of padding against the floor. 
His doctor recommended a knee joint replacement. Once you have this procedure, it is difficult to kneel. So this worker could not go back to doing the same type of work unless the work could be done in a different way without kneeling. As mentioned, soft tissue injuries do not happen suddenly. They develop slowly over time. This diagram shows that as a worker performs hard physical activity over the course of a day, the horizontal axis, the worker may experience a gradual increase in pain or discomfort, the, the vertical axis, the blue line that is increasing. But at the end of the day, when the worker stops doing the work, the pain and discomfort go back down or go away. These mild symptoms improve as the tissues of the body heal. However, as the time goes by, a worker's body may not have enough time to heal between new episodes of work. This slide shows what happens to the worker when there's not enough time to heal the tissue between each episode of work, even with a long period of rest, such as over a weekend. The blue line shows increasing pain or discomfort when a worker is performing an activity. The dotted line shows the pain decreasing when the activity stops and during rest. But as time goes on, the worker never fully recovers and gets all the way back to normal before having to begin the activity again. Oftentimes, workers experience moderate to severe symptoms that develop over many months or years. This diagram shows the progression from normal, no symptoms, to developing mild, moderate, or severe symptoms. It underscores why early awareness of what's happening to your body is important. Early on, the body can heal to get back to normal there's a 100% chance of recovery. As the worker has moderate to more severe symptoms, even with a lot of rest, the body cannot recover completely and the worker is unable to gain normal function. That's why it's important not to ignore early symptoms and to seek treatment early when you have the greatest chance of recovery. Construction workers, just like pro athletes, need to take care of their physical health to have a long career and stay employed. Early symptoms include pain when you kneel, bend over, and walk. When you notice pain and discomfort, change how you are doing your work or your work tasks. If the symptoms don't improve, see a doctor. If you wait too long to get medical help, you may require surgery in order to get better. What is ergonomics? Everybody's body has different abilities in terms of strength, flexibility, and tolerance. Ergonomics is the way to prevent injuries by setting up the work environment and tools to make the job fit the physical abilities of the worker. Work should be designed so most workers can do it without tearing down the tissues of the body to get the job done. Examples are all around you, such as the shape of a tool handle or an extra handle to hold on to. By working within the physical limits of your body, you will eliminate the risk of overexertion, sprain, and strain injuries. There are six ergonomic hazards, high force, poor postures, fast prolonged repetition, stress from body contact, hand or body vibration, environment. While all exist in construction, the most common hazards are high force and poor postures, which are the focus of this training. The first ergonomic hazard, force, is the effort needed to move an object, such as lifting a pipe, moving a bag of mortar, or pushing a cart. Can everyone lift the same amount of weight safely? No. How do you know when someone is lifting something that is too heavy for them? They have to jerk the object to get the movement started. The load keeps falling over while they carry it. You have to take frequent rest breaks. The weight of the load affects the low back. The weight can be measured through spinal forces in the joints of your low back. In the diagram on the left, the first figure is standing upright with no load. The spinal force from gravity on the low back is 80 inch pounds. The second figure is holding a 20 pound load close to their body, 10 inches from the hands to the low back. This is an ideal posture to carry a load. The spinal forces go up to 170 inch pounds. If the load is moved away from the body to a distance of 20 inches, the spinal forces increase significantly 
to 260 inch pounds. So how close you hold an object makes a big difference to your low back forces. The last figure shows the large increase in spinal forces from lifting an object from the floor. The distance to the box is larger and the body is not upright. The spinal forces have more than tripled from the ideal figure of 170 inch pounds to 635 inch pounds. The two figures on the right side of the slide show a curved back posture on the top, a poor posture which causes high spinal disc pressure. The bottom figure shows a locked back, straight posture. By keeping your back locked in a straight position while lifting, your spinal forces stay low. The second ergonomic hazard is poor postures, often called awkward postures. Many workers will work at the floor level using a forward bent back posture. Working in a bent back posture causes increased spinal forces. Other workers will kneel to work on the floor. This may cause a contact stress between the hard ground surface and your knee. It is helpful to use knee pads or other cushion to eliminate contact stress. The photo on the far right shows a worker doing overhead work. Anytime your hand is positioned above your head height, there is a high stress on your shoulder. Work that is at or below your head height is much easier on your shoulder. Other ergonomic hazards include highly repetitive work, contact stress other than knee contact with the floor when kneeling, vibration of the hand, which is common when using power tools like a jackhammer, and vibration of the body if operating powered equipment while sitting. Solutions are being developed. For example, through CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training's research, the overhead drill press shown earlier was developed to reduce overhead work, and a lateral drill rig was developed that reduces vibration risks. There are a number of solution or controls that reduce the risk of ergonomic hazards. Some controls reduce the risk better than others. This figure shows the hierarchy of ergonomic controls. The types of controls at the top of the triangle are best, while the controls at the bottom are just okay. Engineering controls generally use equipment to reduce, reduce the risk. An example is to use equipment to lift and move heavy objects. I'll show you some examples on the next slide. Work practice controls use the best methods to perform the task. Examples include using safe lifting techniques or team lifts. Scheduling, or is more commonly called an administrative control, shares the work between workers. Usually a foreman or superintendent must authorize using this solution. Other is the lowest control that offers the smallest benefit. Examples include knee pads or stretching exercise. If you have no other option, stretching exercises may be helpful. We'll talk about those later in this presentation. To reduce force and, and injuries, the first step is to plan your work. You must think through how you are going to do the work and what equipment will be needed for a safe lift, the engineering controls. Your employer should provide you with lifting equipment for the heavier loads and train you on how to use it. This slide shows several examples of lifting equipment. Since many of these tools are on wheels, it's important to keep the work area clear of obstacles and debris. In other words, engage in good housekeeping practices. When planning your work, you should also consider safe work practices. NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, their lifting equation can help you or your employer determine what a safe weight is for you. But since using the equation may not always be an option, one person should not lift objects weighing more than 50 pounds on their own and should not carry heavy objects long distances of more than 100 feet. And work involving tools, equipment, or materials that weigh more than 25 pounds should be handled at waist height, not overhead or on the ground. This slide shows the zones that you should try to work within. Ideally, work should be located close to your body. This diagram of your prime real estate shows that usual work should be done in the green zone between your wrist and body. Overhead work is close to your head height. Low work is just below your waist. 
Occasional work may be done outside of that area, in the orange zone. The red zone is going to put your body in an awkward position. This is the work zone where you have the greatest risk for injury. If you reach forward to the red zone, you could end up with shoulder and low back pain. It's important to set up your work area so you can avoid working from the ground or floor by raising the work up. Use a cart or stand to assemble materials. On this slide, a jig or pipe stand on a tripod is being used so the worker can work at waist level. If you must work on the ground, limit the time you spend on the ground. Do part of the work at your waist height. If you kneel, use knee pads or other cushions. Reaching up overhead to perform a task puts extra strain on your shoulders and low back. If you work overhead, use a device such as a lift or ladder to raise you up. Position the equipment so the work is at or near your head height. The top photo shows a worker reaching over a head. The shoulder angle is greater than 90 degrees. This worker could use a taller ladder or a scissor lift to get closer to the work. Tools with long handles or extension can also reduce overhead reaching. As, as mentioned at the start of this presentation, the most common ergonomic hazard is lifting objects or, or equipment or materials. It is important that you learn how to lift objects using proper body mechanics. We're going to review different ways you can lift objects, including several one-person lifts, including one for testing the weight of an object called the heft test, different methods for lifting lightweight and heavyweight long objects, and one for lifting a heavyweight small object. We're gonna practice two-person or team lifts and talk about when you should push versus pull objects. Later in this presentation, I'm going to introduce some interactive online resources that you can use on your own as refreshers on safe practices. Before we get into the lifting methods, as mentioned earlier, prior to doing any lift, it's important to plan how you will safely perform the lifting task. You'll need to determine the weight of the object, its size, how far you will have to move it, and whether the path is clear of obstacles. Then you need to choose the best lifting method. As a reminder, a one-person lift is okay for an object that weighs 50 pounds or less, and you need to make sure the carrying distance is acceptable, usually less than 100 feet and free of obstacles that could create a trip or slip hazard. If it weighs more than 50 pounds, you should use a two-person team lift and make sure the carrying distance is acceptable and free of obstacles. Now, we're going to review several safe lifting methods. The heft test is the method used to check the weight of an object be before performing the full lift. The idea is to position yourself as if you're going to conduct the lift, but only lift the object about one inch off the floor. This allows you to assess the weight of the object and test your ability to lift it without risk of injury. If you have to jerk the object to raise it off the ground, you need to get help. There are three steps in the heft test. First, Approach the object from the front with your feet shoulder width apart and move close to the object. Then bend your knees and hips, lock your back, and lift the object only one inch up from the ground, as shown in the middle photo, and set the object back down. If the weight is acceptable to lift, use the straight or power lift to lift uh, as shown in the final image. Remember. Avoid letting your knees extend beyond your feet. Don't just squat down to lift something and always keep your core tight. When you lower the object back down, lock your back and move smoothly, bending your knees and hips only. The straight lift is used for rigid objects located in a confined area or against a wall. For this lift, you need to Approach the object from the front with your feet shoulder width apart and parallel to the object. Move close to the object and bend your knees and hips. Lock your back and lift with your back straight. Do not twist. Then use slow, smooth movements to lift the object. 
A power lift is used for a rigid object located in an open area. So unlike the straight lift, which you would use in a confined space because you have less room to move, for this lift, you can angle your feet and get close to the object. For a power lift, you would approach the object from the front with your feet on each side or at an angle, move close to the object and bend your knees and hips, lock your back and lift with your back straight, no twisting, then use slow, smooth movements to lift the object. This one person lift, also called a golfer's lift, is ideal for picking up lightweight objects. If you play or watch golf, you'll notice that experienced golfers use this technique because it reduces the spinal forces when bending forward to reach the floor. To use a golfer's lift, you would approach the object from one end, bend forward at your waist on one leg, lift opposite foot off the floor, and grasp the object and lift, lowering your foot to the floor as you use slow, smooth movements to lift the object. This slide and the next one show two common methods for lifting a heavyweight long object. While the pole in the images is shorter than the one commonly used for this technique, it will give you a sense of the steps involved in the lift. For both methods, you should check before you start to make sure that no one could be hit by the object during the lift. You may also want to place a cushion on your shoulder if an object is very heavy or has edges. The first example shows one person lifting a heavyweight long object. First, approach the object from the end and get close. Then, half kneel or stoop to reach the object and raise the end of the object to your shoulder. Rise to your feet while walking the object forward on your shoulder. And at the midpoint of the object's length, balance it on your shoulder. Walking forward, holding the object with two hands, while avoiding hitting other workers or objects with the front or back end of the object. This slide shows another method for a one-person lift of a, of a heavyweight long object. This method is often used to carry a heavy object, such as a heavy pipe, but caution should be used to lift the pipe at the midpoint to avoid the weight of the pipe causing your back to bend backwards. Like the other example, you may also want to place a cushion on your shoulder if an object is very heavy or has edges. For this lift, approach the object from the end and get close. Half kneel or stoop to reach the object, rise up to your feet and stand the object upright on end. Stoop down, lock your back, place your shoulder near the midpoint of the object and tilt the object towards your shoulder. Grasp the object to balance it and stand it upright. Then, with the object balanced on your shoulder, walk facing forward, no twisting, and avoid hitting other workers or objects with the front or back end of the object. The next few slides describe using a two-person lift method to lift a heavyweight long object. This method is good for carrying one very long object or a shorter one that is too heavy for one person to handle. When two people are involved with a lift, they should first discuss how they plan to do the lift. For this lift, each worker approaches the end, the object from an end, and moves close to the object, feet shoulder width apart. Next, both workers should lock their backs and bend their knees and hips. Then, communicating. One, two, three, lift. Lift with back straights with no twisting, using slow, smooth movements to complete the lift to waist height. Then the person in front should move around to the side of the object and they should both walk forward in the direction of where they need to deliver the object. This slide shows two workers using the method just described with a 10 foot object. The two workers start by planning how they will carry out the lift. Once they've done that, they each approach the object from the ends and move close to the object, feet shoulder width apart, with their backs locked and knees and hips bent. They communicate, one, two, three, lift, 
and then lift with back straight with no twisting using slow, smooth movement. They hold the object at their waist with the front person moving to the side before they start moving forward. For a situation involving a two-person lift that requires both people to turn and carry an object, the front person must step to the side of the object facing forward. Like the earlier example, both workers would need to plan the lift and follow commands to lift the object to their shoulder. One, two, three, lift. And use verbal cues to begin walking forward in the direction of travel. The two-person lift is also a good method for carrying two heavyweight long objects, as long as the combined weight is an acceptable load for the workers, since it may provide better balance across the body than carrying one object. This slide shows the steps involved. Like the earlier lifts, the two workers should discuss their plan for the lift first. Then, each approaches the ends of the objects and the, and the front person turns toward the direction of travel. They each lock their back, bend their knees and hips, grasp the object from the ends, and communicate one, two, three, lift. They use slow, smooth movements to lift with their back straight with no twisting. They then hold the object at each end and walk forward. A good one-person lift method for small, heavy objects of non -rigid or non-rigid objects, such as a sack of materials, involves rolling a heavyweight object up the body. To use this lifting method, a worker should half kneel directly in front of the object, lock their back, and roll the object onto their thigh. Roll the object to their waist, holding it firmly close to their body, and push off on their back foot to rise to a stand. Once the worker gets their balance, they would move forward. In addition to safe lifting practices, there are other safe practices that can be used. As this slide shows, since the strongest muscles of the body are your legs, you should always push using your leg muscles to move objects that are located below your waist and you should select carts or other devices that will allow you to push objects located on the floor. To move objects that are located above your waist, you should pull since your biceps are stronger than your triceps. When engaging in this practice, position your body so you can pull objects located above your waist towards you. If the object is tall and you cannot see over it, you should have a coworker assist with moving the object. So either one pushes and the other guides the object, or both stand in back of the, uh, on either side of the object, so they have a clear view in front of the object and push. When lifting and carrying materials with handles, consider using gloves with rubber dots to increase grip stability and using padding or a clamp-on handle to make bucket or pail handlers easier to grasp. Alternating the hand or shoulder you use to carry materials, and as mentioned earlier, using padding on your shoulder can also help. So why is it important to always follow safe lifting practices? Since construction workers are at a risk for painful injuries, opioids are commonly prescribed for pain relief. As a result, opioid dependency has become a serious issue for construction workers and the industry. I want to focus on how preventing pain up front can help you avoid pain medications, such as opioids, which may lead to addiction. While opioids are commonly prescribed for pain relief by doctors, they are strong addictive medications so they should only be used if your doctor says they are the best option to manage pain. Before taking prescription opioids, first ask your doctor for information on all available treatments for pain. There may be non-addictive medications or treatments available. Misuse of opioids prescriptions, including taking more than a prescribed dose, taking someone else's prescription, taking multiple opioid medications, 
or taking high doses for long periods of time can all lead to opioid dependency and addiction. Think about the risk. One out of four people prescribed opioids for long-term pain become addicted. Thousands of people die from overdoses each year. In 2017 alone, more than 49,000 people died from an opioid overdose, and overdose deaths on the job are on the rise. Remember, only take opioids if they are the best option and follow the dosage prescribed. Do not take opioids for long periods of time, more than 30 days, without consulting with your doctor. This slide shows two resources that CPWR developed to help you understand the risk and get proper treatment if you are injured and in pain. The first is the online version of a hazard alert card, and the second is a physician's alert. The hazard alert card covers some of the statistics I just covered, as well as steps you can take to prevent addiction or get help. The physician's alert has two parts. The first part provides information for you on the risk and how to talk to your doctor about treating your pain. The second part is to give to your doctor so they can better treat you. It includes information on, for example, how some jobs require drug testing and the drugs workers are commonly tested for. To prevent an injury and the need for pain medicine, as we discussed earlier, you need to be aware of the hazards. Use lifting equipment and safe lifting practices and get early treatment if injured. Stretching exercise can also help and are highly recommended to improve flexibility, movement, and posture and relieve muscle and joint tightness, but they only help if you do them properly. You should always use caution when stretching so you do not feel pain and always use slow, smooth movements and hold the posture for about 15 seconds when you stretch. The coaching section of the interactive resources that we'll discuss later walks you through different stretches, lets you try them out on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, and shows you what you are doing right and wrong. The following two slides show a few examples that you can try today. I'm going to briefly describe each one, and then we'll try them out. The low back stretch is a good reverse stretch, particularly if you've been working in a forward bent back position, such as working at floor level. To do the stretch, put your hands on your low back and gently lean backwards slightly. Hold. All right, the next stretch is a good stretch if you're working in an awkward head neck position. Tilt your head gently to the right and hold. Then. Gently tilt your head to the left and hold. Shoulder rolls are good to release tension in your head, neck, and upper back, particularly if you've been working with your hands overhead or reaching with your arms away from your body for a period of time. Slowly roll your shoulders up and back and around. Repeat 10 times. Another good stretch is the forearm stretch. Reach your right arm out, and with your elbow straight, gently pull your hand back and hold. Then, bend your wrist down and pull your hand towards your body. Now, let's do it with your left arm. Reach your left arm out, and with your elbow straight, gently pull your hand back and hold. Then, bend your wrist down and pull your hand towards your body. Many of us have tightness in our hamstring and calf muscles. To stretch your hamstrings, extend one leg forward with your heel on the floor and your to toes pointed up. Hold. Let's repeat with the other leg. Now, let's stretch your calf. Extend one leg back with your foot flat on the ground. Then, gently bend your front knee. Feel the stretch on the calf of your back leg. Hold. Let's repeat with the other leg. Since everyone from the apprentice to the contractor has a role to play in preventing the risk for injuries, CPWR's Best Built Plans program 
includes materials that contractors can use to plan for how materials will be safely lifted and moved on job sites, and interactive training and coaching resources that you can use on your own to practice or as a refresher. These materials are designed to reinforce the importance of, one, planning for how materials will be lifted and moved, and two, using safe lifting techniques, including equipment and team lifts and practices. You can download them to your computer or use the app available for Android and Apple smartphones and tablets. The interactive training resources have a voiceover that allows you to click on items to learn more about planning and selecting equipment to lift and store materials. The lifting and work practice sections, sections of the training resources walks you through a refresher of the safe lifting practices and then lets you use a mouse or touchscreen to move a figure through different lifts. The fundamental part of the coaching section lets you move the figure during different lifts and show you, shows you what happens to the body when the lifts are done right and wrong. The coaching section also includes a warm-up section that lets you try different stretching exercises that can help prevent an injury. Like the other interactive exercises, you can see what happens to the body when you're doing them right and wrong. There are also two games that you can play on your smartphones to test what you've learned. They're a fun way to test your knowledge. You advance through the games by making safe decisions. You can get to the games directly through your app store or by scanning the QR code on the hazard alert mentioned earlier. The first game raises awareness of the impact on your body of lifting from an awkward position or lifting heavy materials without assistance. And the second game focuses on the job site and the importance of planning how you'll lift and move materials, what equipment or help you may need, and if your pathway is clear. As this game advances, the construction site becomes more complex and injuries are tracked on the strain bars. You have a handout with instructions on how to download and use these resources. I encourage you to try them out. Just to recap what we covered today. We covered how to identify ergonomic hazards, the basic ergonomic control to prevent injuries, the proper body mechanics for lifting, the benefits of doing stretching exercises, review safe lifting practices, and we looked at the risks of using prescription opioids. Thank you.